Today we're going to be concluding our overview of the book of Acts. We're going to be covering chapters 21 through 28. So we've got a lot of work to do. And we're not leaving till it's done. You know, at the end of the second century, the book of Acts was known as the Acts of the Apostles. But you know, as we've studied these past few weeks, in reality, we'd have to call it the Acts of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, in verse 8, Jesus gives us the outline and in fact the vision of the early church and indeed the book of Acts. He talks to the apostles and he says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The vision of the apostles, the command to the early church was the title of our lesson today. The evangelization of the nations in a generation. Are you with me here, church? You know, most people date the beginning of the church, and thus the beginning of Acts, at the traditional date of 33 A.D. And yet, most likely, it was 29 A.D., as Jesus wasn't born in the year zero. He was born in the year 4 B.C. By the time we conclude our study today, we'll be in the city of Rome with Paul, where he writes the book of Colossians, in which he says... This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. Paul got the job done in a generation. Turn to Acts chapter 9. We see that even before Paul was baptized, there was a vision that was given to Paul and shared to him by the disciple named Ananias. We read in verse 15 of chapter 9. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. You know, right here is a very interesting text. Because this is the destiny that awaits Paul if he accepts the challenge to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He was going to evangelize the Gentiles, their kings, and the people of Israel. Now the word evangelizing literally means spreading the good news. And yet we see right here that when God calls him to be his chosen instrument to spread the good news, he adds in verse 16, I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And so this leads us to our very first point. Evangelizing brings suffering. I mean, it's a little bit ironic. Spreading the good news brings suffering. Remember the first missionary journey was chapters 13 and 14. The second missionary journey essentially is chapters 15 to the middle of 18. And the third missionary journey is where we left off. It's verses chapters 18 through 21. Let's pick it up. In chapter 21, Paul has come to see James and the apostles there in Jerusalem. And he shares with them all the awesome things, all the good news from what God is doing amongst the Gentiles. And then James shares with them all the thousands of Jews that have become Christians there at Jerusalem. And James says to Paul, but there's only one problem. A lot of the Christians here doubt that you've been following the law of Moses because they've been so poisoned by the persecutors. And so we want you to take a vow of purification. We want you to take with you four other of our brothers to vouch for you in this vow of purification. That's exactly what Paul does. But even in this attempt to be right in the eyes of God and the eyes of men, we read this in verse 20, severing as evangelizing brings suffering. Verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us! 
This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people and our law in this place. And besides, he's brought Greeks into the temple area and defied this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with Paul and assumed that Paul had brought him in to the temple area. Well, of course, we can learn right here that we should never assume. Amen, guys? The bottom line, Paul hadn't brought any of the Gentiles into the temple area. The Jews had falsely assumed it. But we see right here, as always, persecution was following Paul. Poisoning always followed Paul in his efforts to spread the good news. Verse 30. The whole city was aroused. I mean, I'm telling you, Paul brought things to a head wherever he went. Amen, guys? And the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him from the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops that the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander and his soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. So right here, he's in fact rescued by the Romans, by the Gentiles. Now the amazing thing about Paul is even though this crowd is in an uproar and they've assumed falsely that he has been breaking the law of God, very interestingly, he turns to the commander and says, hey, I want to I wanna talk to these people. Now, what's interesting is that Luke notes two times. Once in verse 40 of chapter 21, and then secondly, in chapter 22, verse 2, that Paul does not speak in Greek or Latin or even Hebrew. But he speaks in what Luke says in the Greek... Hebraeus dialectos, Aramaic. That was the common language of the Holy Lands right there. And so by doing this, by sharing in this language, Paul was saying, hey, don't you see? I'm one of you. And so he shares his conversion story. We're fairly familiar with it. And we'll pick it up in verse 12 of chapter 22. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. So you see right now, he's sharing his conversion story and crafting it to his audience right here, who are Jews. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear words from his mouth. So once more, He's reiterating, the God of our fathers, the Jewish fathers. Verse 15, you will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. Once more, it's clear right here. Paul was to get the message to all men in his lifetime. That's the command of God. Amen, church? Come on. Verse 16, and now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. You know what's kind of interesting to me is that Paul kind of had to be shoved into the water. You know, today, I'm thankful that we haven't had to shove three of our four baptisms. I mean, Manny's one to be baptized, Tahi's one to be baptized, Devin's one to be baptized, but we've had to shove Ryan a little bit right there. So maybe she will be a female Apostle Paul right there. Amen? You see, when you're baptized, that's when your sins are washed away. And you may be here, and you've never participated in New Testament baptism, where you enter the waters of baptism as a disciple of Jesus Christ, and then are baptized to have your sins forgiven. So you can have a personal relationship with God. What's the Spirit saying to you today? What are you waiting for? I'm glad that Ryan is joining us. Amen, guys? Let's move on to verse 17. Remember, evangelizing, spreading the good news, brings suffering. Paul goes on. He says, when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and saw the Lord speaking quick. He said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately, because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, 
I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, go, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. What a radical conversion. Paul was saying to God, but, but God, these people know that at one time I was numbered amongst the persecutors. I was holding the very clothes of those who shed the blood of Stephen. And God says, Paul, the door is closed, but the window's open to go to the Gentiles. You know, sometimes as disciples, we see doors close in our lives. And we sit in self-pity, not looking around for the window that God has opened. God is always showing us where to go. But sometimes it's through suffering and the places we never think about going. Well, we read on and we find these words. The crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He's not fit to live. As they were shouting and throwing off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the commander ordered Paul to be taken into the barracks. He directed he be flogged and questioned or to find out why the people were shouting at him like this. As they stretched him out to flog him, Paul said to the centurion standing there, is it legal for you to flog a Roman citizen who hasn't even been found guilty? When the centurion heard, when the centurion heard this, he went to the commander and reported it. What are you going to do now, he asked. This man's a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, I am, he answered. Then the commander said, I had to pay a big price for my citizenship. But I was born a citizen, Paul replied. Those who were about to question him withdrew immediately. The commander himself was alarmed when he realized that he had put Paul, a Roman citizen, in chains. You remember last week how we talked about Paul's strategy for world evangelism? How he would walk by several lesser cities until he came to the leading city of that region. And there he would preach the word first in the synagogue. And then to the Gentiles. We notice the strategy was not just city to city, but in every city, he went after the influential people in that influential city. That was his strategy, amen? Well, right here, he thinks of another strategy. It's pulling the Roman citizenship card. <laughs> you see, Paul was born a Roman citizen. This is what God made him in order to fulfill his destiny. God had him born at the exact time and the exact place. And he made Paul be born a Roman citizen. Have you ever wondered why the color of your skin is what it is? Have you ever wondered why you're not five feet taller? Have you ever wondered why you were born in a certain place? It's because God wove your DNA and made it just exactly perfect for the destiny upon which he's calling you. you. Say, well, why couldn't I be five inches taller? Why couldn't I look different? If he made you different, you'd have been too prideful to become a disciple. <laughs> so when you look in the mirror this afternoon or tonight, or maybe as far away as tomorrow morning, Look at yourself and imagine the destiny for which God has created you. Now we find right here that the centurion is quite puzzled. Why all this uproar about this guy, Paul? So he takes him to the Sanhedrin. And he wants to find out what the heck is going on. Chapter 23, verse 1. Paul looked straight at the Sanhedrin and said, My brothers, I have fulfilled my duty to God in all good conscience to this day. At this, the high priest Ananias ordered those standing near Paul to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewash wall. You sit there to judge me according to law, yet you yourself violate the law by commanding that I be struck. Those who were standing near Paul said, You dare to insult God's high priest? Paul replied, Brothers, I didn't realize he was the high priest, for it's written, do not speak evil about the ruler of your people. Wow. Is this incredible? Right here, Paul was a man of deep conviction. 
And when he was unrighteously slapped across the face, he said, what the heck are you doing, you whitewashed wall? <laughs> now, the Jewish brothers around say, hey, don't you know this is the leader of your people? You've just violated the command of God. Now, here's something we see that's amazing. Paul apologizes by quoting the very scripture he violated. Exodus chapter 22, verse 28. But notice, in the midst of his apology, he doesn't compromise any of his convictions about the truth. He's willing to admit where he was wrong, but he's not willing to give in to his persecutors and those that would attack his basic convictions. Are you with me here, church? You know, Friday... Elaine and I celebrated our 33rd wedding anniversary. That's, that's, that's as long as Jesus lived. And different brothers and sisters come up to me, bro, how do you do it? 33 years! Well, the answer's found in this scripture right here. You gotta learn to apologize. That's how you do it. It's the only way to make it, brothers. The only way to make it. All jokes aside, as disciples, we got to be humble in the midst of our holding conviction that we have the truth. Because as one guy said, what is evangelism? It's simply one beggar showing another beggar where to find bread. See, one of the challenges of true Christians, of true disciples, it's because they know they have the truth, they get all pumped up. Hey, I got the truth. Yeah, it's by the grace of God that you have it. And when you sin, you be humble and you apologize. Because nobody's perfect. And if you're looking for a perfect church, you're not going to find it. Say, well, why? Because you're sitting right in the middle of it. And nobody's perfect. But we still need to strive to follow the word of God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when we mess up, we apologize and move forward. Look what happens. Verse 6. Then Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out in the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I'm a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. The Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and there are neither angels nor spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. There was a great uproar, and some of the teachers of the law who were Pharisees stood up and argued vigorously. We find nothing wrong with this man, they answered. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? The dispute became so violent that the command was afraid Paul would be torn to pieces by them. He ordered the troops to go down and take him away from them, and by force brought him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, Take courage. As you've testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify me about in Rome. You know, right here, Paul cleverly divides the opposition on the issue of resurrection. That was his message. And it's kind of interesting that once more, a Gentile is used by God to pull Paul to safety. And it must have been a frightening thing. To have spoken to all the most powerful men of all of the nation of Israel, the Sanhedrin. Of which Paul probably aspired to be a part of one day. And to realize, to see the kind of hearts that they all had. The, best, the following night, the Bible says, the Lord stood near Paul and said, take courage. He came to Paul to take courage because he needed some courage. And he says, as you've testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify about me in Rome. You know, interestingly, we referred last week in Acts 19, verse 21, that Paul had a desire to go to Rome because I think he was kind of figuring out his strategy that if he got to Rome, the largest and most influential city of the known world, then he could influence the whole world. But now that inkling, that desire has now become a command of the will of God.
Have you ever had an inkling and a desire that you saw to become a commanding vision of God? Often, you need the Lord to say to you, take courage, because it's challenging where God is calling you to go. See, evangelizing absolutely brings suffering. Let's continue to read. Verse 12. The next morning, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. Now, this is a group of serious guys. More than 40 men were involved in the plot. Woo! That's a lot of them. They went to chief priests and elders and said, We've taken a solemn oath not to eat anything until we've killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petitioned the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard this plot, he went into the barracks and told Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He has something to tell him. So he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, the prisoner, sent for me and asked me to bring you this young man to you because he's something to tell you. The commander took the young man by the hand, drew him aside and asked, what is it that you want to tell me? He said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them, because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, Don't tell anyone that you reported this to me. Well, you know, we have a very fascinating little insight by Paul right here. Is that it's Paul's nephew, his physical nephew, that finds out about the plot to kill Paul, some have asked, well, did he become a Christian? Well, in my opinion, probably not at this point. Why? Well, his name's not mentioned. Usually, when people become Christians, their names are mentioned. Turn to Romans chapter 16. In Romans 16, Paul is saying his greetings to the brothers and sisters there in Rome. And in verse 7, a very interesting verse, he says, Greet Andronicus and Junius, my relatives, who have been in prison with me. They are standing among the apostles, and they were in Christ before I was. See, Paul had family that was Christian before he was. Maybe that flared up even some of his zeal against Christianity. But notice the guys right here are named. As a matter of fact, they are suffering in prison, even with Paul. And so the silence of his nephew's name most likely means that, at least at this point, he's not yet a dis disciple. The other thing that makes us lean in that direction is the fact that he even heard about the plot of the Jews. So you'd have to suspect that somehow, some way, he was privy to the inside information from the Jews, which a disciple was not going to be. But when he found out that Uncle Paul was in a heck of a lot of trouble. <laughs> He's the one that goes to the commander, Claudius Lysias, and spills everything. Verse 23. Then Claudius Lysias, Lysias called two of his centurions and ordered them, get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Provide mounts for Paul so that he may be taken safely to Governor Felix. He wrote a letter as follows, Claudius Lysias, to His Excellency, Governor Felix. Greetings! This man was seized by the Jews, and they were about to kill him. But I came with my troops and rescued him, for I had learned that he is a Roman citizen. Well, that's not exactly how it happened right there. I mean, he was about to flog him. Then he learned he was a Roman citizen. He was not saving him because he was a Roman citizen. Amen, guys? You see, the world is always about twisting the truth to make themselves look a little bit better. See, as disciples, we are what we are. And we still love each other. Why? Because we're so awesome? No, we're commanded to love each other. It's not a choice. But it's a decision that we make with the heart. Hey, is there anybody you have conflict with in the body? Is there anybody you're not really tight with? You need to get right with them today. Because the Bible says quite clearly in 1 John, 
If you can't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you possibly say that you love your God whom you have not seen? You know, right here, I find it very interesting that God uses Claudius Lysias in a very powerful way. When he hears that Paul is about to be assassinated, Claudius Lysias says, hey, we've got to get this guy down to Caesarea to, Cla to Governor Felix in order to protect him. And so he calls two of his centurions, and they get ready a detachment of 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen. Now, that's a pretty cool protection right there, amen? I mean, that's just God. I remember a couple of years ago when the death threat was made against Tim Kernan and Leanna and myself in London. Though it was a bit disconcerting that the price on the head was only $2,000. The Lord took care of us because the authorities thought it so serious that everywhere we went, we had a coalition of bobbies or London police just with us all the time. It was awesome. See these guys here? It's great. Just, everywhere you go, you feel, here you go, sir. Here you go, sir. It was awesome. God takes care of you. You believe that or not? But you know, here's a conviction that we've all got to have. In evangelizing, and that's what disciples do. That's our mission. That's our purpose. In evangelizing and spreading the good news. It'll bring suffering. It'll bring suffering physically, emotionally, financially. Paul had nothing. And even spiritually, it'll have a hit. But you've got to ask yourself, is my faith, is my life, is my doctrine even worthy of persecution? You know, some who call themselves disciples in the past and were heavily persecuted now are no longer persecuted. Why? Because they've said, peace, peace to the world. How about you? Are you willing to suffer even through persecution because you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Paul did, and I believe you do as well. Our second point is evangelizing. Spreading the good news brings kings. Yes, even kings need the gospel. Remember in Acts 9, at the charge that God gave through Ananias, Paul was to go to the Gentiles, their kings, and the Jews. Of course, we remember the strategy of Paul. And the command of God, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Isn't it interesting that here in chapter 23, Paul had just finished evangelizing all the most high-powered Jewish leaders. Now, he's going to take Paul to evangelize several of the high-powered Gentile leaders. Let's go on in chapter 24 and pick it up. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullius. And they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullius presented his case before Felix. We have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. But in order not to worry you further, I would request that you be kind enough to hear us briefly. We have found this man to be a troublemaker, stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He is a ringleader of the Nazarene sect. The Nazarene cult has even tried to desecrate the temple. So we seized him. Well, we see right here that the conspiracy, the plan to kill Paul at this point has failed. So I guess those 40 guys are pretty hungry right now. <laughs> but now, and the reason that Luke cites that the Greek lawyer Tertullius was, was used right here is to show how serious the Jews were in their prosecution of Paul. This guy would have cost tons of money. They were that serious about trying to hurt Paul. We read on. Paul shares his faith. And in verse 22, 
Then Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, that's what the disciples were called, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he says, I will decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul in the guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was a Jewess. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid and said, that, 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 that's enough for now. You may leave. When I can find it convenient, I will send for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. When two years had passed, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. But right here, we meet Governor Felix. Well known in that day. But very interestingly, he's married to a much more well known woman. Drusilla, as the Bible says, she was a Jewess. Interestingly, she is one of the three famous daughters of Herod Agrippa I. Now, who's Herod Agrippa I? He's the guy in Acts 12 that beheads James and then is eaten by worms. Remember that? How's that for a dad? Amen. <laughs> Interestingly enough, Josephus, this is the noted Jewish historian, writes, she indeed exceeded all women in beauty. Man, when you get into the history books for your good looks, you're cranking good looking. Amen, guys? <laughs> Interestingly enough, we know from history that she was married at 14. Felix takes her away from that husband and marries her. So now you can begin to understand the texture a little bit more. At this point, she's 19 years old when she's hearing all about Paul and the way. Now, as I said before, she has a pretty famous family. She had the two sisters, Marianne and Bernice, and we'll talk about Bernice in just a second. And as I said, her father was Herod Agrippa I, who murdered James. Her great uncle was Herod Antipas. He's the one that beheaded John the Baptist. Her great grandpa was Herod the Great. He's the one that had all the babies killed in Jerusalem there in Matthew chapter 2, called the slaughter of the innocents. Wow, how do you like that for family lineage? And so you see right here, when Drusilla and Felix are listening to Paul as he spoke about faith in Jesus Christ, and as he discoursed on righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix got a little nervous. And he says, that's enough for now. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I will send for you. You know something? There's never a convenient time to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so we find, bottom line right here, two years pass. He's not freed by Felix. And then another man comes to be the governor. Felix does a lousy job. He's taken out of that role. And a new governor, Porcius Festus, who all the records indicate was an incredibly good man becomes the governor, though he only reigns for three years and suffers an untimely death. And so his reign coincided just at the right time to intersect with our brother Paul. And so we read in chapter 25, verse 1, these words. Three days after arriving in the province, Festus went up from Caesarea to Jerusalem, where the chief priests and Jewish leaders appeared before him and presented the charges against Paul. So, they're still working on Paul. Yeah. And so, Paul appears before Festus. And we begin reading then in verse 9. Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I'm now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I've not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourselves know very well. If, however, I'm guilty of doing anything that deserves death, I do, not, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his counsel, he declared, You've appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you will go. 
Paul figured it out. If I go to Jerusalem, I will die. As a Roman citizen, I have a privilege that if I'm not satisfied with the local jurisdiction's handling of my case, I have an unbelievable right. I can take my case to Caesar himself. But he also figured it out. This is my ticket to Rome. <laughs> and he also figured it out. Not only was he being taken to the most influential city of the world, but now he was going to go before the most influential person in the world. Pretty awesome, huh? Well, read in verse 13. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived in Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. Well, I mean, they were so fired up about the new governor coming on in that the king of this whole area, King Agrippa, this is King Agrippa II. This is the son of the guy that beheaded James and was eaten by worms. This is the brother of Drusilla and Mariana and of Bernice. And once more, it's the woman who is the most famous from a historical point of view. This guy is called in history Herod Agrippa II. And Bernice was known in the Roman world as the most beautiful of all women. Sadly, as you can infer right here, King Agrippa, her brother, and her had an incestuous relationship. She was widowed two times before she hooked up with her brother. And right here, she's only 31 years old and her brother is 32. And yet, her fame comes because many years later, she is taken from her brother by none other than General Titus, who is the general that destroyed and annihilated Jerusalem in 70 AD. He is the son of the emperor Vespasian. And he would become the next emperor. She is taken by him from Jerusalem after the destruction to Rome itself. And though the Romans were heathen, they looked upon Bernice with such public disdain and outrage that Titus never married her and in time put her aside, said. And the question comes, well, what happened? Well, it's kind of cool right here in verse 23. The next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking officers and the leading men of the city. At the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Now, what's kind of cool right here is Festus has asked King Agrippa, say, hey, you know, Paul is being brought before the Roman courts with some pretty flimsy charges by the Jews. I need some help on how to frame his charges when I send him to Caesar. Would you please listen to Paul? And, of course, the Bible says that Agrippa and Bernice come on in with great pomp. Now, the cool thing here, the Greek word is, pomp is Fantasia. I mean, in an incredible, almost a fantasy kind of way. There, there was such an extraordinary, ostentatious way that, that they came on in. And Paul was going to be brought before them, look at this, with the high-ranking officers of the Roman legions and the leading men of the city. Do you think our brother Paul was fired up or not? You see, he's gotten to preach to the governors, Felix and Festus. Now he's preaching to the king, Agrippa, just like destiny said he would, as well as the high-ranking officers and leading men of the city. Well, we go on and we pick up his defense in verse 19. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those of Damascus, then in Jerusalem and all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached they should repent and turn to God and prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts, tried to kill me. But I have had God's help this very day. And so I stand here, testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets of Moses would say happened. That the Christ would suffer 
and as the first to rise from the dead, will proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At that point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Because from his Roman mind, he's thinking, how can there be a resurrection? But look what Paul says, verse 25. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. The king's familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to them. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in the corner. King Agrippa, do you believe in the prophets? I know you do. He says, I know you're a Jew. I know you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time along. I pray, God, that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and Bernice, and those sitting with them. They left the room, and while talking with another, they said, This man's not doing anything to deserve death or imprisonment. Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he'd not appealed to Caesar. Luke just underlines it again and again. Paul was guilty of nothing except proclaiming Jesus Christ. You may say, well, why did he share his faith with King Agrippa and Bernice? I mean, these were utter heathens who professed to be Jews. Well, I think the secret is held for us in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Hold your finger right there. We'll be back. Look what Paul writes. Verse 13. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was showing mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, I was showing mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. In everyday language, what was Paul saying right here? Hey, if I can become a Christian, anybody can become a Christian. He saw himself as worse than King Agrippa or even Bernice. He says, hey, if I, the worst of sinners, can become a Christian, anybody can. And so that's why he preached with such conviction to governors, to officers, to kings, and perhaps in time, to the emperor himself. He believed they could change. Do you have anybody that you believe is impossible to become a Christian? Maybe you need to reconsider who you were before you became a Christian. Because for many people, you were the impossible convert. You know, the Lord has blessed me to be able to share my faith with several high-profile people. I still remember... In the early days of L.A., when I first came in the early 90s, I wanted to go see the Lakers practice their basketball over at UCLA. And I was so fired up when I was over there with some of the brothers. I said, ah, there's Magic Johnson! And then they said, now, brother, you need to understand that here in L.A., we leave our celebrities alone. It is very uncool to talk with them. I said, bro... We're disciples, and I'm going to go talk to Magic. <laughs> I did. We had a 20-minute conversation. We later built a relationship. My kids have even been to his house a few times. I got a chance later on to share with former President Carter and his wife, Rosalind. But perhaps one of the most powerful individuals I ever got a chance to share my faith with was Nelson Mandela. Of course, you know the movie Invictus is coming on out right now. It's out. Amen. And the Lord had opened that door because in our former fellowship, we'd done a great work amongst the AIDS victims in South Africa. And so the opportunity came to go to the South African White House and to spend a half an hour with Nelson Mandela. And yeah, it was kind of one of those Forrest Gump moments. But nonetheless, I was there. And he got asked to church. Why? Because if I can become a Christian, if you can become a Christian, then anybody can become a Christian. You see, evangelizing brings kings. Spreading the good news brings kings because even kings need some good news. 
Let's finish it on out. Last point. Evangelizing brings adventure. <laughs> Spreading the good news brings adventure. Now, I've got a scripture I want you to memorize. Let's get excited about that, eh, Mingus? John 3, verse 8. Jesus says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You know, anybody that wants to plot out their own life, you're not a disciple. A true disciple is blown by the wind. And of course, the word wind and spirit are one in the Greek. And Jesus is making a bit of a play on words right here. It's that a true disciple doesn't know where he's going because he doesn't know where the spirit is going to blow him. Amen? Amen. Let's get into our text. It's now time to take out your maps. Everybody got a map? Yeah. Eleni, you want to hand me the map, please? Ken, did we hand out the maps? If you need a map, uh, raise your hand. Maybe uh, some of the other brothers can help join handing out some of the things. Last week, we gave out this map that I thought did an outstanding job of covering the first, second, and third missionary journeys of Paul. But in particular, I thought it does an equally great job of showing the cities in relation to the Mediterranean world of this last couple of chapters in the book of Acts. And so we get back to chapter 27. Remembering our third point, evangelizing brings adventure. Verse 1, you can look at your map as we go on. You can see that he's going to be taken off from Caesarea. And we read in verse 1, chapter 27, these words. When it was decided we would set sail for Italy, Paul and some other prisoners were handed over to the centurion named Julius, who belonged to the imperial regiment. We boarded a ship from Andromedium about to settle from the ports along the coast of the province of Asia. And we put out to sea. Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica, was with us. Now that's one of the young preachers that was mentioned in Acts 20, verse 4. The next day we landed at Sidon. And Julius, in kindness to Paul, allowed him to go to his friends so they might provide for his needs. Now it's kind of cool right here. The word kindness in, in Greek is philanthropia which was one of the most esteemed virtues in the Hellenistic or the Roman world, to be a philanthropist, to be kind. And so right here, we find that Julius, a high-powered officer, had this incredible quality of philanthropy towards Paul, and he allowed his friends to take care of his needs. Verse 4. From there, we put out to sea again and passed to the Lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. When we had sailed across the open sea off the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we landed at Myra in Lycia. Okay, now look at your map right here. You see where we started out there from Caesarea to Sidon as he goes all the way on over then to Myra. Now we're going to stop there at Myra for just a moment because there's a very, very famous tradition that comes out of Myra. In the late 3rd and the early 4th centuries, the Christian leader in Myra was a man that was later called St. Nicholas. In the Netherlands, he of course was called Sante Claus. In America, you guys know him as Santa Claus. He was martyred during the Dilation persecutions. But a legend arose about his, his gallant leadership during the Middle Ages. And there was evidently a, a very poor man in town who had nothing but his three daughters. And so, because he had nothing to eat and nothing for them to eat, he had determined to sell them into slavery, prostitution. However, when Nicholas heard about this, he goes to all the brothers and sisters and collects every little bit of money that they had, even though they were very, very, very poor. Well, he divides the money into three bags. And he tries to enter the house secretly, because he didn't want this man to know where the generosity of people had come from. And so he tried to enter the house 
through the doors and the windows, but they were all locked. And when they were locked, he says, I'm going to drop them down the chimney. And the legend goes, it's when they miraculously fell on the floor, they bounced into the stockings that the girls had just finished washing. So now you know where Christmas comes. It's time to move on from Myra. Amen, guys? Verse 6. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. Verse 9. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because now it was after the fast. Yom Kippur, September. So Paul warned them, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives as well. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, now, you know, you got a feeling right here that this is not a good thing that's about to follow. <sighs> instead of listening to what Paul said, follow the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship, non-Christians. You know, it's never good to follow the advice of non-Christians versus the disciple of Jesus Christ. Amen, guys? Amen. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided that we should sail on, hoping to reach Phoenix and winter there. There was a harbor of Crete facing both southwest and northwest. You can see this on your map as well. Verse 13. 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they thought that they had obtained what they wanted. So they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. Now, it's kind of cool. The Greek word for this that, that Luke chooses is typhoonicus, which we get the word typhoon from, amen? The ship was caught by the storm and, and could not head into the wind. So we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed the lee of a small island called Calder, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. When the men had hoisted the board, they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together. Now, in the olden days, the lifeboat was always towed behind the ship. And so they had to pull the lifeboat aboard or otherwise it was just going to fill with water and it would act like an anchor that would drown the whole ship. So they pulled the lifeboat aboard and then it was getting so rough, they passed ropes under the ship to tie it together. <laughs> Fearing they would want to ground the sandbars of citrus, they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After the men had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up amongst them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice. Now, isn't that just like our brother Paul? <laughs> Here they are. They've been in sea. The boat is rocking. Everybody's getting seasick. There's no food. And he goes, Guys, I'd like to call a little meeting. I just got to start out to me by saying, I wish you'd have taken my advice. <laughs> have you ever had your disciples say that to you? <sighs> I wish you'd taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. See, when you don't take advice, you're going to get a lot of damage and loss. You know what I'm talking about right here? <sighs> but now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, whom I am and whom I serve, stood before me, and he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. Wow! Paul had guessed that God had wanted him to go to Caesar. That's why I appealed to him. That's how he's going to get to Rome. Now it says, God says to him, I want you to go and share with Caesar. Why? Because even Caesar could become a disciple. Verse 25. So keep up your courage, men. For I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. <laughs> Amen, Paul. You know, right here, I think this little tiny verse in verse 25 gives us that little morsel that we need if we want to become powerful in our faith. Paul says, keep up your courage, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. See, when you read your Bible... You need to have faith in God that it's going to happen just as he told you. When you have that kind of a faith and you have courage to put it into practice, the Lord is going to use you powerfully. Well, we find that they go on and on. They do indeed shipwreck. 
And then we read in verse 42 these words. The soldiers plan to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. And now we fully understand this because this has been a sub-theme all the way through. That if a prisoner escapes from a Roman guard, it's the Roman guard that would be killed. But what happens? Verse 43. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. Now, what did Paul say? He says, no lives are going to be lost. Oh, yeah, the ship is going to be destroyed. And it was. The centurion stops anybody from being killed, any of the other prisoners. And then, the, of course, the charge is just given right here. He orders anyone that can swim just to jump overboard and swim on the shore. And the Bible says the others of them got planks and kind of surfed in the shore right there. Chapter 28, verse 1. Now, is this an adventure or not? Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. See where Malta is at on your map right there, guys? The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer. For though he escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. <laughs> is that cranking or not? Here's a fun little insight. The Greek word here for snake is ichidna, which literally means viper, poisonous viper. It's the same Word, the exact word, when Jesus talks about the Pharisees, and he says, you brood of a China. You brood of poisonous vipers. Jesus laid it out right there. I thought that was a cool insight, but, I mean, if you don't. <laughs> Verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and for three days entertained us hospitably. Well, obviously, not all the guys from the ship went to this unbelievable estate. But probably Paul, Aristarchus, and of course, Luke. And bottom line, uh, maybe Julius got to go. You say, well, how come they got such preferential treatment? Remember, Paul was a god right here. Gods do good. <laughs> Verse 8. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him after prayer, placed his hands on him, and healed him. When this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. They honored us in many ways. Now, the word honor there usually carries the connotation of giving money. And that'll be helpful to Paul when he gets to Rome. They honored us in many ways. And when they were ready to sail, they furnished us with supplies we needed. Verse 11. After three months, we put out to sea in a ship. That had wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with the figurehead of the twin gods, Castor and Pollux. Gemini, of course. Verse 12. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there for three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Regium. The next day, the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached Petuliae. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them. And so we came to Rome. I mean, it's kind of like he says, and against all odds, we came to Rome. The brothers there had heard that we were coming, and they traveled as far as the Forum of Appius and the three taverns to meet us. At the sight of these men, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. We got to Rome. Paul's allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. Well, there's much to be said right here. The first thing that we see is that the disciples were hospitable. Here was Paul and the brothers, and they put him up for a week. That's what disciples do. There's no such thing as being put out as a disciple. To be a disciple is to be hospitable to other disciples. I think the other thing that stands out here, and you can see this once more on the map, that the brothers came all the way up from Rome in two groups. One of the groups met them at three taverns, which is about 30 miles away from Rome. The other group met them at the Forum of Appius, 40 miles away. So Paul's coming to Rome with the brothers, and here come the brothers from Rome. And the Bible says he was just so encouraged, and he thanked God. 
See, that's why we go to the airport and we greet everybody that visits the City of Angels Church. That's just what disciples do. Some of us travel 30 miles. Some of us travel 40 miles. It's never too far to greet another disciple. We always want disciples to know that they have come home even in a city that is not their home. Because disciples need to be able to go to any city on earth and find other disciples that will give them housing, food, and lodging. Are you with me right here? And so it's disciples. That's just what disciples do. Read on. Verse 17. Three days later, Paul called together the leaders of Jews. When they assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I've done nothing wrong against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar. Not that I had any charge to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound with this chain. Now, it's kind of interesting. Paul is so trusted, he's only got one soldier on him right now. Verse 16, he was not a flight risk. They go, this guy's totally trustworthy. Just put one soldier. Now, he's still got a chain on him with this dude. But only one guy. That's how trustworthy Paul was, even when he was incarcerated. Verse 22, this is very cool. They replied, we've not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And other brothers who have come from there has reported or said anything bad about you. But we want to hear what your views are, for we know that people everywhere are talking against this sect. See, Paul had such a profound impact that there were letters that went out, particularly trying to damage Paul's character and his life. Now, evidently, the letters had not been received by the brothers there in Rome. And, and yet they were saying, but people everywhere are talking against this sect, this cult. You know, for some that, that know my life, you know that there are some that have put out letters against me to try to undermine me. And yet, amen, that just gets the gospel out there more. And we need to understand, that's just like in the Bible, and that should encourage us. Amen, guys? Well, he preaches to these people. Some of the Jews accept him. Some don't. And we read in verse 28 the conclusion. Therefore, this is what Paul says, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, but what happened to him? The book of Acts is it's not about Paul. The book of Acts is about the story of how the gospel went into the entire known world. As a matter of fact, most likely Paul is released in a year or two because of the references made in books like 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus. And he is imprisoned in late 66 AD and he is beheaded in 67, early 67 of course, we remember the passage in 2 Timothy chapter 4 where it talks about that his time is short. He's being poured out like a drink offering. And he only says, and he says, Luke alone is with me. What a faithful dude, huh? He's writing to Timothy. He says, you come to me and also bring John Mark. He's proved helpful to my ministry. Wow. That's pretty incredible, huh? At the end of his life, those are the three guys he wants you know, as I think about our charge to evangelize the nations in this generation, and I think about my life, I realize that the most precious thing that God has given to me is time. You know, last night, I'm working on a lesson. I got this call from Ron, and he told me all about his condition with his neck. And I said, bro, you've got to get to the hospital. He goes to the hospital, and immediately upon being examined by a surgeon with a CAT scan, he's rushed into surgery. They were deathly afraid this huge infectious death would spread to his brain or heart, and he would be killed. And Ron's a young man, 40 years old. See, time, life, is so fragile. As I shared earlier, Friday was Elena's and my 33rd wedding anniversary. And we had, we had an incredible time. 
We got a chance to minister to my niece. We got to be a thick and roar. And we had a great meal that night. I won't talk about the free limousine and all of that. <laughs> we came back and let's just say it was a nice romantic night. In the middle of the night, I am woken up by this thud in the back bathroom. And I thought that Elena had slipped and fallen. When I went on in, she wasn't moving. And I'm shaking her, Elena. And she, she'd fainted. I said, okay, just a sec. So she, she got back up, was standing there for a second, and fainted again. And this time, I, and I was, I was worried, I was crying. I said, I said babe, I, I need to get you to bed. I, I picked her on up, she was walking through the vessel, and then she fainted a third time. And I forget, she opened her eyes, she goes, did I faint again? <laughs> yeah, and we're going to call 911 right now. <laughs> no, no, give me one more chance. <laughs> so, with my 50-year-old, 55-year-old back, the Holy Spirit empowered me to be able to get her into bed. <laughs> But so all that night, I, I just couldn't sleep because I, I didn't know. I didn't know what had happened. I still don't. She'll be going to the doctor this week. Amen? <laughs> and, you know, here is, here is the person that I've spent my life with as my partner in the gospel. And I didn't know if it was the end. You know, church, value the time we have together. Value the relationships we have in Christ. Oh, as disciples, we're saved and we're going to go to heaven. That would be awesome. But in heaven, there's no marriage. Don't believe in that false fantasy. Understand that God has given us time. And God has given us a charge. You know, the DC-5 are being sent out today. Numbered amongst them, of course, are Carlos, Lucy, Afa, Jeannie, and Jack. You know, three years ago, Jack and Jeannie came to Portland from Gainesville, Florida. And I hear from Ken Zindler, who also sat on the back row, that that's where Jack spent most of his time in the church. <laughs> and I remember talking to Jack. I said, Jack, you're 59. You have time for one more adventure. Come, be with Elaine and me and the L.A. mission team, and let's plant a cranking church in L.A. He goes, okay, bro, one more adventure. Well, today, he's being sent off by the Holy Spirit to D.C. for a second adventure. <laughs> I don't know how many adventures... The Lord will give us. But never forget, evangelizing brings adventure. Because we believe with all of our heart in the motivating vision of Jesus in the early church, the evangelization of the nations in a generation. Thank you, and God bless.